bit far away. That's Lee, good. are you there? Yeah. Can you see my hips on the... Yep. Good. Yep. So over to you and Eve now for a minute, if you want. We, ha we, se have we, we seem to have lost Neve, so I think to avoid any further delay, I just welcome everybody and thank you for joining us and hand over to Alan. And thank thankfully, we seem to have got technology working. So carry on there, Alan. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Um, and thanks, Neve and Jared and the Monster Agricultural Canine Society for having me tonight. Um, we are going to, my name is Alan Ahern, by the way, uh, I'm a small animal vet in Clonmel, uh, South U Veterinary Hospital. Um, I have a postgraduate certificate in small animal surgery and I have an interest in uh, hips and elbows as well. Um, so um, we're going to talk tonight about hips and elbows and uh, I'm just going to give a, a brief overview um, as to what we're hoping uh, to touch on. So we're going to talk about um, hip dysplasia, um, the disease itself a little bit. We're going to talk about, uh, we're going to touch on genetics. Uh, we're going to talk about how we score hips. And likewise, we're going to do something similar um, uh, with elbows. Um, we're going to have a little chat about some of the different schemes outside there. And at the end, we'll have um, a question and answers and um, any issues that you might feel irrelevant, feel free to ask. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll rock on, okay? I'm going to try and ensure that I don't use too many medical or veterinary terms because it's easy enough to get lost in that, um, with, with, with that. So anyway, uh, hip dysplasia. So dysplasia is um, pretty much a Latin word used to kind of define any abnormal growth um, of cells. And in this instance, we're talking about the, um, cartilage cells and hips and uh, hip dysplasia is is an inherited condition it's a genetic condition and if you were to uh, I suppose if you were to boil it down uh, you'd, you'd, you'd be kind of talking about the ultimate formation of loose hips um, and uh, they also talk about this as called uh, as, as being called hip laxity and um, most certainly environmental factors um, contribute to this um, weight being a big issue um, and um, uh, this ultimately will lead to the formation of osteoarthritis and pain, okay? Um, so um, just going to move on there now and um, just a little kind of graphic there as to give you an idea as to what's happening. On the left um, with this, uh, I don't know if my cursor coming up here, yeah, here, um, we see um, a kind of a schematic of a normal hip and we have an even distribution of forces through the, what we call the ball and the socket, okay? So the, the weight is going up the leg and it's been evenly distributed through the head of the femur or the ball and right through the socket, okay? And if you could just do one thing at the moment and that's just to remember that nice curvature of the hip because we'd be referring back to that as the evening continues. Um, uh, so, uh, when we get loose hips or, or hip dysplasia, um, we get this kind of a situation whereby we get uneven um, distribution of, of, of weight and forces through the joint. And um, this ultimately results in the situation over here um, where you get remodeling of the bone and you get this kind of mushroom-like head on the, on the femur and a very flattened um, socket or acetabulum. They call, the, they call this the acetabulum and this the femoral head. So this is the acetabulum. And again, if you could just remember that flattened line and this mushroom head that's appearing. So this is kind of a, an, an idea as to um, how uh, we end up with a, a painful hip or a dysplastic hip. Now, um, that being said, um, this is obviously a very, if, if any of you had seen um, hip x-rays of dogs before, you'll know that this isn't really what you want to be looking at. Um, and this is an eight-year-old dog. And we can see here, oops, let me go back. Uh, we can see here that it's very um, gnarled. Um, it's very irregular. Um, and um, it's, not, it's not a pleasant picture. The irony is that this dog is actually a client of mine. It's a 
it's a cockapoo. It's a nature old cockapoo and it has been coming into me for boosters every year and for other little bits and pieces and it has never been lame and it has only been since it's put on a few COVID kilos um, that it has got lame on its back right leg um, and um, it is of no surprise. Um, we took an x-ray and we were very surprised to see this. That being said, this is that little dog in our hydrotherapy pool now at the moment, doing well. It's lost a little bit of weight, not a huge amount, as you can see, um, but we're getting there and um, things, are, things are going okay. So basically that's just to illustrate the point that um, I guess with very arthritic hips, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that we have a very immobile dog. They can, they can manage at times, okay? Um, Could I just interrupt you for a moment yeah, sure. to say to uh, the viewers that if they want to ask a question, if they do it through the chat button at the bottom, and we'll address the, the questions to you at the end of your presentation. So That's there's, great. There's a little chat button either at the top or the bottom of your screen. So if people just type in the question, sorry, sorry about that now. No, you can hear me okay? Yep, no problem. Okay, that's great. Um, so um, that's that's basically an example of that. This is another example of um, of um, of loose hips, of of dysplastic hips, and we can see here that we're beginning to get this triangular appearance on the head of the femur, and and equally we're kind of getting little bits and pieces beginning to develop around here. And these are arthritic joints. These aren't nice joints. And this is this is an example as to, I guess, what we're what we're hoping to identify and avoid going forward. So um, that's just basically an overview of, of, of hip dysplasia. Um, so what's the story as regards presenting your dog um, to get their hips and elbows scored? I'm sure um, quite a few of you have already been down this road, but for anybody that hasn't, um, there's just a, a couple of basic things. Um, the dog needs to be microchipped. Um, it needs to be a year old or more. Um, there are one or two organizations that require them to be a little bit older. I'll discuss that uh, in, in, a, in a while. Um, if we're going through the British Veterinary Association, which is one of the organizations we use to score the hips, uh, we'll also see the kennel club number. It's not compulsory, but it's nice to have it. Um, and um, the other thing is, I haven't it on the slide here, but your dog needs to be fasted because it's going for a general anesthetic. If you look up the literature, it says either deep sedation or general anesthetic. Personally speaking, I don't find deep sedation is very helpful. I think that the dog actually needs a general anesthetic. It's a short general anesthetic. It's a safe general anesthetic, but it does need a general anesthetic uh, because under sedation, we can even, or even under deep sedation, we can still get quite a bit of tension around the muscle mass um, in the hips and it can, uh, well, it, it, it can affect the, um, the overall score. Um, so then the vet uh, or the nurse will put the microchip number, uh, the date of the, um, of, of the x-ray, left and right markers, uh, and maybe the kennel club number that's there on the x-ray, and this is sent so that everything is identified uh, properly. The view we take for the hips is what's known as a hip extended view. So this is with your dog on its back, and um, this needs to be done carefully. Um, and also real uh, care and attention needs to be made uh, to, to, to how um, the positioning is done. It needs to be done um, to ensure that um, it's symmetrical, that there's, that there's no tilting, um, that the hips are centered on the um, x-ray and, um, and, and that the kneecaps are present as well if possible. And we also have to ensure that the that the correct exposure uh, is, is 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 made, and uh, this is to ensure that good quality images are sent. Um, if they're less than good quality, um, they will sometimes be sent back uh, to the vet, which isn't a nice experience to have to phone the owner and tell them they have to come back in again and put their dog through general anaesthetic. But also, it can affect the marking if they're not if they're not one hundred percent either. Um, and then finally, the images are sent on. Um, what's known as DICOM software. That's a universal software that allows uh, x-rays to be read. Um, so that's, that's basically an overview of what happens when the dog comes in. Um, when you get your score back, and I'm not going to spend too long on this particular uh, image. When you get your score back, um, it's going to be marked out of 106, which is 53 for each hip. And the only reason I put this slide up is because you will get 
a printout of this from the BVA and you'll also get an email of this from the Australian scheme if you were to get your HIP score through them. And the top two scores here refer to the looseness of the HIPs and the remaining seven scores refer to the secondary changes that have, that, that have happened to HIPs because of the looseness. Um, and when the, the, the people that score HIPs are looking for secondary changes, these are the areas that they look for them. Okay, so they look for them here and here and here and here and here and here. So for people that are interested in these x-rays and, 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 and how they, and how they um, score them, these are the locations that um, the scrutineers are looking for secondary changes. Uh, so if ever anybody wanted a, a copy of that, there's no problem, I, I, I send it on to them. Um, so um, at the moment, um, there are different schemes available to us. Traditionally, um, we would have been using the BVA and the Kennel Club uh, scheme. If you were to ask me a year ago, uh, if you were to come with your Labrador looking for to get a tip scored, I wouldn't have even thought twice about it. I would have immediately assumed that we were going through the BVA, um, the British Veterinary Association and their association with the Kennel Club. But since COVID, there has been huge issues in um, in getting scores back from the BVA. Um, there's, they, they seem to be struggling uh, in processing. Um, so at the moment, um, you could be looking at a four to six month turnaround. In actual fact, I took images back in September and I'm still waiting for them. Um, so um, uh, in conjunction with, with, with other breeders, uh, they've recommended uh, the, Australian Ken, uh, the Australian Kennel Club scoring uh, system, which is called VET scoring. Um, and since the middle of December, we've been using that and um, it's been it's worked out very well for us. Um, very quick turnaround, two to three days um, and um, it's cheaper. Um, so um, so we've been using that. Now, there are pros and cons to all of these systems. The second the, the third system we've used is the uh, Orthopedic Foundation of America scoring scheme. Again, it's fine. Um, there's a European scoring system, the FCI system. Um, again, I haven't used that one, um, but um, it's widely used in Europe. Um, for people that show German Shepherds, there's the SVGSD or GSA system. Uh, I, I'm on the panel for that and we use that. Um, and then finally, uh, there's the pen hip system of scoring hips. Um, and um, that's quite a, quite, a, quite a good system as well. And um, it probably would be worth uh, talking about at the end of the talk if anybody was interested in it. Um, the likes of uh, internationally, uh, the guide dogs are using this, and it's a, it's 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 it has a high, um, what's known as predictability, uh, uh, um, I suppose index to it. Um, so they're the different systems we use. Um, and to be all nice if they all use the same grading system, but they don't. Um, and um, so, for instance, we can see here that the Orthopedic Foundation of America over here on the left. Uh, what they consider a good, uh, we can extrapolate as being a 5 to 10 on the BVA system. Uh, the, on the FCI system, it's an A2. And on the um, SV system, it's an A normal. So just give you, there's, there's different ways of, of, of marking the hips and that the different uh, schemes use. Um, so it's just to be aware of it and, and how they kind of measure up. Okay. Um, so are there any issues? Well, I suppose... <clears throat> I suppose the big issue is that maybe not enough dogs are being scored um, so that um, we large population out there that we don't know what their hips are like and uh, what their genes are like and you know how their pups are shaping up so uh, I guess that's that's probably one of our biggest issues um, the next point to put down then is the, the the predictive value so what I mean by that is um, if we have uh, 10 dogs with low scores What's the percentage of those 10 dogs that um, will subsequently pass on the gene for hip dysplasia? Um, and at, at the moment, they reckon it's about four out of 10. So um, that's probably a bit of an issue. Uh, so um, the sensitivity of the test um, is probably uh, about 60%. Um, so, um, but bear in mind, uh, these are screening tests. And their job isn't meant to be 100% diagnostics. They're meant to weed out uh, as best they can 
uh, through a population um, the issues that we're looking for. And in this instance, it's hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia. Um, there are differences between the schemes and there are pros and cons to each scheme. Um, and I won't spend too long at it, but I mean, if you were to look at, um, say, the BVA scheme compared to the, um, to the Australian scheme, um, they use three scrutineers to assess every image. Um, so that would, I suppose, mean that, you know, no stone is left unturned, so that's good. Um, the disadvantage is that it's more expensive and it's slower. Um, if we were to talk about the Australian scheme, um, they only use one person to score the images. So it's possible that something could get past that one person, but they're fast and they're, they're, they're um, uh, less expensive than the, uh, than the BVA scheme. Um, so, you know, there are pros and cons. The OFA, uh, we've used them quite a few times as well. Uh, the pros would be, the advantages would, would be that they're quick, again, a couple of days turnaround. Again, they're not expensive. Um, and uh, I'm putting in a pro as being that they kind of have a minimum of two years before they'll allow your dog submit the scores. Um, but equally, other people would consider that a disadvantage. Um, and uh, they'd say, well, two years is too old. They have a different grading system, which, you know, uh, if you're used to the BVA system um, is, a, is a problem and they have only one scrutineer. So there are different issues. Um, and I suppose the other one then is, um, and this is probably uh, a question for the, the Kennel Club to a certain extent, is, is the data that we're losing conceivably uh, by having our dogs scored in different jurisdictions. Um, I guess it, it makes it, does it make it harder for us to provide estimated breeding values and, 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 and mean breed scores for our hips? Maybe, I don't know. Um, so anyway, these, these, these are different areas that we could discuss later on. Um, so um, just before, uh, before I kind of ramble on too long, um, I want to just show you a few images of, of hips. These are hips that we took in the clinic or hip x-rays that we took in the, uh, in the clinic. And um, this one was taken a few months ago. And uh, if you remember at the beginning of the talk, um, I was asking you to uh, look for nice uh, curved heads and nice curved, it's all curves, nice curved uh, circles here, right? So um, this dog actually hadn't a brilliant score. It had a score of 16. It had, um, it had a seven on this hip and it had a nine on this hip. Um, and I guess if I just load this up a little bit here, uh, yeah. um, we can see here that there is a little bit of looseness here. Okay, so this is what, if you're looking at your x-rays, this is what you're looking at. Is, it, is there a bit of a space here? Um, uh, uh, is there, is there straightening of this line? Is this line beginning to get a bit straight and flat looking? Maybe, possibly here. Um, the other thing is that we have the ability inside in the clinic to measure the what's known as the Norberg angles. So that gives us another indication as to how loose these hips were. Um, so, so these were a nine and uh, a seven. So it gave us an overall score of 16. Um, these then, and you could say the positioning isn't 100% here. It was very difficult to get brilliant positioning on this dog. Um, but um, again, if we just highlight the hips again, we can see that we have lovely curves here and the balls are really well seated into the sockets. Can you see that here? This dog had an overall score of one. It's a Bernese. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's a good kind of example as to what's what's really ideal and what's you know maybe less than ideal I don't know um uh, we have another image here of um a dog that had an overall score of 15 and um, so I think this actually is 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 kind of good to illustrate a point it had uh, a six here on this hip and surprise, surprise, it had a nine here on this hip. So again, if you can see that there's not great cover here of the, of the femoral head. And in actual fact, on this one, if you were to really look at it for a while, it's, it's beginning to get a little bit of a mushroom appearance. I think it is. 
Um, so you know this didn't this did this graded a nine, and this graded um, a, a six. So um, that's just, I suppose, a bit of a an overview of 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 hips. Okay. So um, I'm sure I've left out stuff, um, and feel free to pick me up on any questions later on. There's no problem. Um, so I'm conscious also that I don't have too long to, to talk. I think it's 30 or 35 minutes here. So I'm going to move on to, um, to elbows uh, and elbow dysplasia. And elbow dysplasia is not a nice condition. Um, it is probably one of the more common conditions we see uh, from a pet owner point of view coming in with, 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 with sore elbows as a, as, as a juvenile, as a young dog, and then when they're older, um, kind of thick elbows and, and arthritis in their elbows. So uh, it's, not a nice, it's not a nice disease, and it is uh, a combination of one or, or more conditions. Um, and uh, they're known as a, a, an ununited ankyneal process. A fragmented coronary process, OCD of the of, of the humerus and incongruity. And excuse me for uh, coming out with those four terms, but it needs they, they need to be mentioned as being part of the overall uh, elbow dysplasia uh, condition. So the elbow is made up of three bones, as you might or might not know: the radius and ulna. Um, join the humerus to form the elbow joint. The humerus goes from your elbow to your shoulder and the radius and ulna go from your uh, elbow to your wrist. And um, it's how those bones meet up um, and they have to meet up perfectly. If they don't, we get elbow dysplasia. Um, and um, one of the areas that that becomes apparent at a young age is up here. You see that just at the top where it says Ankinius. Okay. That little piece, that little beaky piece of bone um, is where we'll identify radiographically uh, changes to um, the elbow joint. Okay. Um, and um, we will see that uh, in, in x-rays now in, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, the grading system for elbows is simpler than it is for hips. Uh, there's four grades. Uh, there's zero, one, two, and three. Zero being what we want, uh, one being um, kind of a mild, two being a moderate, and three being a severe case of elbow dysplasia. But unlike hips, we really just want zero, if the truth be told. Um, well, certainly from a reading uh, point of um, from a reading point of view, uh, the other thing about it is that um, with um, with elbows, it's the worst score counts. So what I mean by that is um, that um, if you have a score of one on the left elbow and a score of zero uh, on the right, your overall score is one. Uh, whereas if you have a score of one on the left and one on the right, it's still an overall score of one, whereas if it was the hips, it's it's an it's an um, it's a cumulative score, so to be one plus one equals two. Um, so uh, it's it's the best or the worst score counts. Uh, we take uh, two views of the elbows. We take one flexed and one extended. Um, so uh, that's pretty much it. So when whenever we have dogs coming in for uh, to have their hips and elbows scored. You're pretty much talking about um, five five X-rays in total, two for each elbow, and um, and one for the, the hips. Okay. So, and this is subtle, um, but this is an X-ray that we took about six or seven weeks ago. And uh, if you can see that little arrow uh, there, that po that's pointing to what looks pretty nondescript, um, that's the bony change that we're talking about that will ultimately lead to a score of, uh, was a score of one in this case. I'm just gonna magnify that up. So if you can see this here, this rough cloudy edge, I absolutely understand if that's not that obvious, but there is a little area here that the scrutineers look at and they measure it. And if it's less than two millimeters high, 
um, they score at a one. If it's um, two to five millimeters high, they score at a two. Um, and if it's more than that, um, they'll score at a three. Uh, the other thing with scoring at a three is they'll also look for other signs of elbow dysplasia. So um, just briefly mentioning those four conditions, um, the OCD affects this little bone here. This ununited ankyneal process is where this doesn't fuse properly. It's rare enough we'd see that presented to us now for hip and elbow scoring uh, because they'd be actually lame with it. But the most common one by far is what, uh, is what affects the piece of bone down here. And it's known as a fragmented medial coronary process. But pretty much all of them will result in this little bony reaction up here because the, because the, the joint isn't, isn't seated properly, okay? Um, so, so that's an example of that. I have a few of these actually. Um, and in actual fact, I'd say, gosh, I'd say maybe one in four elbows that I'd x-ray, I'd probably see it. Um, so um, this again was a, was a two. So we can see this little, this little ridge. Can you see it? Little light gray area here. The other thing with this elbow joint is that uh, this is the radius here, and this is the ulna, and they're meant to run into each other. There's a bit of blurring of the lines there. I suspect that was the cause of this situation. So um, this graded a two. Um, and again, you really have to spend a lot of time looking at these. I'm looking at these day in, day out, so it's, it's easy for me to see them. But again, we can see here, there's a little bony reaction here that we wouldn't be happy about. I graded a one. And here was another grade one here. Um, now, um, this one was a zero grade and it's just, it's just a nice example as to you know what we'd be looking for here. Again, we have the radius rolling into the ulna nicely. Um, and when we look up here, there's no sign of any of any bony change. Um, so so that's good. Um, likewise here. So um, again, for just talking about the different schemes, um, the OFA, the Orthopedic Foundation of America. Um, they require your dog to be two years of age to submit um, x-rays to be scored for the elbows. Um, they also require your dog to be two years of age to submit uh, x-rays for the hips. Um, they will do a preliminary scoring for the hips at a year, at a year old. Um, at a year old, yeah. And... Um, uh, but it won't be an official score. It will be a, a kind of a presumptive score, right? Um, so, and there's actually good reason for that. Um, and that is most certainly with the hips, um, the older the dog is getting scored, the better chance he will have started to develop secondary bony changes in the hips. And um, so in effect, then it's a better way of picking up, um, uh, you know, hip dysplasia dogs that wouldn't have necessarily been as apparent at one year of age. So, you know, it's, it's not exactly what we want to hear, but it's, it's, it's probably, you know, a good thing in a way to do them that little bit older. Uh, you know, if you have a low score at two years of age, well, the chances of your dog having hip dysplasia um, would be, well, it wouldn't be that high. Um, so um, that's the reason that they um, use uh, the, the, the two year um, age, okay? And um, actually while I'm on that, I will mention the pen hip scheme. So they don't call it the pen hip and elbow, it's just hips. So we're going to leave elbows now for a minute and just talk about this pen hip scheme. If anybody's heard about it, that's fine. But if, if, if they haven't, it's um, a different scheme. Um, and basically what it does is they put a cushion between the dog's back legs and they squeeze the knees against the cushion. So in effect, 
um, or it's a cushioned frame, I should say. Uh, so they're pushing the hips out. Um, so they measure then the distance that they've been pushed out. And this is a very, very accurate way as to determining whether uh, the dog is a carrier for hip dysplasia or not, because it's really focusing on the looseness of the hips as opposed to the secondary uh, arthritic changes that could potentially develop. So that's basically just a, a quick one on, on pen hip. Now, I'm conscious that I've gone over the half hour or close enough to it. Um, so um, I maybe I've went through it too fast, I hope not, or maybe I've left some stuff out. If so, please bring it up now. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's me. Hello. Thanks a million, Alan. Hi, that thanks, Neve. That was a great overview. Um, we don't have any questions in at the moment. I don't know, is that because our system isn't doing us any favours tonight? But um, just a lot, we start off, a lot of people are, are having, um, doing comparisons between the three main um, scoring systems that are available at the moment. So the BVA, the Sheds, the Australian and the um, OSA. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, um, and um, you know, I was talking about this recently, Neve, and um, you know, there was a there was an interesting case study that you were aware of, um, whereby images went to the three organisations, and um, for the elbows, and um, the elbows were scored two with the shed system, two with the BVA and zero with the OFA. Um, so that, that was an interesting discrepancy. Um, so, um, so yeah, you know, there are differences between them and I think we need to be aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and again, just to be touching on, you know, some of the obvious um, differences, um, you know, it's, I suppose the, the, the speed and the expense uh, and the number of people looking at the images, you know, they they would be, I suppose, the three main the three main things. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from Lorna. Is there any merit in not hip scoring a bitch when she is close to her season? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, and I, I actually meant to bring that up. Um, okay. So there's been quite a few papers uh, done on this. And um, instinctively and intuitively, you would assume that uh, x-raying a, a hip a, a bitch when she's in season or close to being in season um, uh, wouldn't be a good idea because of the effect of estrogen and progesterone on the uh, ligaments and muscles. However, they have found no evidence uh, to suggest that this is the case. Um, and there's been quite a few studies done on bitches um, that have been in season and then the exact same uh, bitch has been x-rayed um, a couple of months later and they've gotten the exact same score. So uh, Laura, to answer your question, at the moment the, 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 um, the consensus is um, that there's no evidence to suggest that it's um, to be avoided. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Kira says, how much free play outdoors is okay for puppies in addition to the five minutes per month of age twice a day? For example, the golden retriever puppy that's a bigger breed. So how much, uh, sorry, what was that? Uh, how, how much, much extra exercise? Oh yeah. How much free play outdoors is okay in addition to the five minutes per month of age rule? Right, yeah. Um, well, I... I think that we need to be careful here because, <clears throat> you know, we, 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 we talk about environmental uh, factors influencing uh, hip, hip dysplasia. And, and we mentioned the, the fact that, you know, overfeeding is obviously a, one of those environmental factors, but doing too much too soon from an exercise point of view um, is, also, is also an issue. Now, 
I think free play wouldn't probably be the worst thing in the world, but most certainly people that would be, you know, um, and I have clients that, well, I've seen it firsthand, you know, overwalking, especially uh, during COVID, it has been very interesting to see people overwalking pups, um, going for four or five miles, um, and uh, the pup only four or five months of age. Um, but um, how much free play outside of the five months, but the five minutes per month? <sighs> Gosh. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, as, as long as it wasn't too vigorous um, and too um, too intense, you know, I guess, I don't know, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes twice a day, that type of thing. Um, uh, you know, free playing, as I said, as long as it's not too vigorous um, and too intense, I, I wouldn't have huge issues with it, you know, yeah. Um, in a nutshell, is there anything you can do with a puppy to ensure the best possible hips and elbows? That's from Anne-Marie. Well, um, I suppose um, the first thing you should do, Anne-Marie, is, is, is to suss out what the hip and elbow scores were of the dog and the bitch that bred the pup. Um, because, you know, it is, it is very much um, an inherited condition. Um, so if if the condition isn't there, well, then pretty much you, you don't have much to worry about. However, if the condition is there, um, you you really do need to ensure that the pup is kept as lean as possible um, and, uh, you know, without affecting its growth, obviously. So making sure that they don't overfeed the pup um, that you don't over exercise the pup. Um, there were studies saying that vitamin C supplementation can help. Um, but other than that, really, I, I think it would be having a very, um, you know, careful look at the breeding that went on with the pup uh, would, would be the first thing that I do anyway. Yeah. Okay. They're coming in thick and fast. Oh God. Um, right. Next one from Olive. Can muscle tension in the hindquarters be an early indicator of hip dysplasia? Um, it it can it can olive yeah because it can suggest um uh hip hip discomfort uh, there shouldn't be excessive tension um uh, up in the what's what are known as the gluteals um the the muscles covering the the kind of rump um and and if there is it could it doesn't it, it's not exclusively to suggest um that it's uh, hip pain but it could suggest um early, early, early hip dysplasia. Yeah, it could. Uh, bunny hopping is another thing that we'll see them doing from time to time. Um, and in severe cases, uh, the occasional little scuff of nails, but um, but yeah, it's possible. Yeah, it could be. Okay, um, there's two questions in um, that relate to this. So I'm going to actually put the two of them in together. So these are from Anne. Are the Australian scores valid here? And also, what age do BVA and Australia um, screen from? Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I suppose that was a, an issue for us when we started sending them to, um, to Australia first. You know, were they valid here? And uh, we, we did a, we checked the bona fides uh, of um, the um, vet scoring with the Australian Kennel Club firstly, um, and most certainly they are who they are. And uh, we also um, contacted the Kennel Club here and um, they, um, they, they they were agreeable to using this uh, uh, system or scheme as well. So um, yes, it is, they are, they are viable uh, here. Um, the other, question was from what age and it is from one year of uh, from one year old yeah that we Great. can submit x-rays on those um a, mess, a question from philip is a dog if a dog is four years old and perfectly fit um and a okay i think there's a misprint if a dog is four years old and perfectly fit what are the chances of them having trouble later with their hips well, um, that's a good question. Um, and I, I'll, I'll probably just revert back to uh, that little 
case study that I had at the beginning of the presentation of uh, that little dog, uh, Millie, um, who uh, only presented to me at uh, eight years of age. And um, I have another dog, a 14 year old Labrador um, that has hips um, pretty much exactly the same as what Millie's hips are. Um, and um, the owner is very good at keeping that dog lean. Um, it comes in for cartoon injections twice a year, but other than that, it has a, it has a, it has a fine life. It, it's quite mobile and active and all the rest of it. Um, so just to, um, like by the point I try to make is that by not exhibiting signs at four years of age doesn't mean that the dog doesn't have dysplastic hips. Um, it just means that they haven't been expressed yet. Um, they might never become expressed. Um, uh, uh, and, um, you know, uh, I, I'm guessing this dog is probably, um, you know, not overweight and um, has, you know, good controlled exercise. Um, so, um, you know, that, yeah, so that's the story there. Yeah. Perfect. Um, does a hip score vary? Um, my goodness, one second now. Does a hip score very different on one side to the other suggest the damage could be from an injury rod rather than the congenital problems? That's from Shan. Um, yeah, I, 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 I see where you're coming from, Shan. I guess if, if you had a score of zero or one on one side and a score of say eight, nine, 10, 11 on the other, it may, you know, you that would be something that you'd kind of raise an eyebrow at and maybe suspect some sort of a, a traumatic event uh, in the dog's history. But if for instance, like on one of the images that I showed up there earlier on, if you had a, a score of a of a five and, a, and an eight or a nine, um, uh, that that really wouldn't uh, suggest anything other than um, uh, different, um, stages of dysplasia in in each hip um it wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily be looking for some traumatic event and bear in mind it would want to be a, a serious enough traumatic event to result in the kind of bony changes that we see um in dysplastic hips um and i guess one of the best examples of this would be um with uh, greyhounds um and uh, you know we see quite a few greyhounds in our clinic and they come in for this and that and um i've never seen a greyhound with dysplastic hips um and um they most certainly would be through the rough and tumble of um you know greyhound tracks and you know traumatic events um but it's rare enough you you'll you'll see um dysplastic change in their hips so um so yeah i hope that maybe might have answered your question yeah okay um, Stephen wants to know, can swimmer syndrome in a puppy cause problems with hips? Oh, uh, oh yeah, I, 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 I would suspect so. I mean, in fairness, um, swimmer syndrome is such a, is such a difficult condition to get them out of in the first place. Um, that, um, you know, for those lucky enough to get through it, um, they will inevitably have, um, uh, well, I won't say inevitably, they will quite possibly have hip issues and possibly even lower back issues as well. Yeah, that the swimmer issue is a is quite a serious um, is quite quite a serious issue that young puppies get, and um, it, I think it's safe to assume that they will have secondary um, changes to their hips and lower back after that. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on the surface of a puppy pen? That's from Janice. Sorry, what what are the thoughts of the surface of a of a puppy pen? So where the where they're reared? Oh yeah, the um, yeah. So I mean, look at it. Um, you know, I I think something along the lines of uh, the grip of a yoga mat um, would be. I mean, it's not a good idea having them on very slippy surfaces. Um, they need to be able to have um, good grip and. Um, they need to, you know, be able to have good mobility as well. It does. It shouldn't be too constricted, especially as they start um, to develop. So, uh, yeah, I, I would just ensure that it was on a, a non-slip surface. Yeah, for plenty of space. Okay. Um, are spaniels, in your experience, prone to elbow problems? <sighs> yes, they are, but not 
not necessarily elbow dysplasia. Um, they can suffer from elbow dysplasia, but unfortunately, um, they suffer from a more serious condition um, called incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle. Um, and um, this is this is a really uh, nasty condition whereby um, part of the, the humerus heading into the elbow joint doesn't fuse properly and um, it can snap um, at any age. Um, so at this side of the Atlantic, we see it in Spaniels, whereas on the other side of the Atlantic in America, uh, they see that same condition um, in Cockers. Um, now, this condition isn't something that's identified uh, in the uh, elbow screening that we're doing as part of the elbow dysplasia scheme. It's a, it's a different condition. It is, again, an inherited condition. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, we, we see it a good bit of gun dogs now in, 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 in English Springer Spaniels, yeah, yeah. Is ED, elbow dysplasia, considered to be highly inherited, hence excluding all but zero scores, preferably from breeding? Hmm. Yes, it is uh, considered an, uh, very much an inherited uh, condition. But bear in mind, um, it's, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a bit of a catch-all uh, term for four distinct and different conditions. Um, the four being this ununited ankyneal process, which is most certainly inherited. Um, fragmented coronary process, again, which is most certainly inherited, um, and uh, OCD then of the, of the humerus, which is inherited, and then incongruity, which is basically whereby the, the bones don't match up properly. Um, what's, what's the uh, uh, heritability index of that condition? I'm not certain, but, um, but yeah, no, they are most certainly, it, it, it is um, an inherited condition and a genetic condition. What was the second part of that question, Eve? again? Sorry. Um, eliminating all bar zero scores oh, yes. from the yeah. breeding program. Yeah, like that would be the goal. That would be the aim to, 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 to um, have a kind of a zero tolerance towards any secondary changes um, that we see in, in these elbows to eliminate your ones, your twos, your threes. It's such a nasty um, condition, uh, to be honest, because um, I showed you an image of, of a very dysplastic hip where the dog was um, not showing any symptoms for the first eight years of its life. Uh, you know, if you saw a set of elbows like that, um, the dog would be in, in a lot of pain from the get go. Um, and um, it, you know, with hips, we have we have surgical uh, ways of, of dealing with them in worst case scenarios, whereas with elbows, we're very limited as to what we can do. Um, uh, most certainly weight control and medication um, ca can help, but it's um, elbow dysplasia is a is a is a nasty condition. And, and really, I think we should try our damnedest to kind of eliminate it, you know? Yeah. OK. Um, what circumstances could cause a bitch to produce a puppy with severe hip dysplasia, but its siblings all have low hip scores? But that's that's a that's a good that's a good question. Um, and, um, you know, I, I guess um, we're we're dealing with um, a genetic condition and um, you could have a dog and a bitch that could have really, really good scores, say hypothetically scores of one and one, for instance, there is nothing to stop a mutation happening um, within um, within that uh, litter for and, and for them to to have a pup with a high hip score that's how these conditions came in the first place were, was was through spontaneous mutations um and um that's how these genetic diseases get established so um it's it is possible it's misfortunate uh, especially when you think you've done everything right um but unfortunately it can happen it can happen yeah um, do harnesses affect elbows if used with puppies from the very beginning of exercise? God, do harnesses affect elbows? Um, I, 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 I really don't know. I, I, would, I would doubt it. I would doubt it, but I couldn't say with any degree of certainty that they do. I know my own pup, I have a six-month-old pup at the moment, and uh, I have a harness on him. Um, 
so I don't know, but I'd stand to be corrected. Yeah, okay. sorry about that, no? Yeah. Um, oh, Martin is back. Can that be both front legs and the spaniel with her? Yes, with it can. Yeah. It can. Yeah, it can, Martin. Yeah. Okay. Um, are all the forms of ED equal in terms of how bad they are breeding wise? Um, well, um, yes or no. The, the ununited ankineal process um, is, is the one that we would kind of associate with having a high, very high um, uh, um, hereditary um, or gen gen genetic uh, component to it. And in actual fact, um, if you look at the OFA and the Australian scheme, they will mark the ununited ankineal process separately on the um, report sheet. Anybody that, 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 have, that has done that, you'll see that the scrutineer will make um, special reference to the presence of that condition. Um, so uh, that's a particularly um, uh, nasty uh, condition and almost uh, needs, you know, needs surgery from the get go uh, once it's diagnosed in the pup. So, um, you know, it's it, if you were to rate them as to uh, the worst of those four, I would rate I would rate an, un an ununited ankineal process um, as being the worst. Um, so, uh, I mean, if I were to just, where is it? Uh, so if you can just see the uh, Ankenese up there, that little beak, um, it's where that, that snaps off or doesn't, doesn't have, the union doesn't form properly. So this, this, this little piece is floating in the joint. So, um, that's, uh, that's a particularly nasty one. So that would be the one that you definitely wouldn't want. Okay. Are, um, are swimmer puppies more prone to elbow dysplasia as well as hip dysplasia or do they come hand in hand? Um, no, I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, I wouldn't have thought so. I wouldn't have thought that the elbows would have been um, like, it's conceivable that that swimmer pup could have elbow dysplasia, but just because it's a springer or not a springer, a swimmer, it doesn't automatically mean that it has elbow dysplasia. Um, in relation to breeding and hip scores, with the means for the most breeds different, how much below the means score would you recommend breeding from? Oh, right. Um, well, again, you know, I guess that's, I mean, that's, that, that's a really good question because, um, you know, I, I think we should be striving to always breed below the mean score. Um, and, you know, the lower we aim for in that regard, the quicker we will ultimately lower that mean score as time goes by. Um, but it's proved to be very um, a very long road to lower the average uh, uh, mean score for for the different breeds but most certainly you know we should be aiming for the lowest score that's available to us um, and again you know i suppose um we are we're dealing with mean scores that maybe aren't necessarily reflective of the irish population so that might be easier said than done um, uh, but yeah, I mean, we should be aiming for as low a score as possible, um, to be fair. Yeah, you know, so um, if if we can get below the average mean score, we should. Okay. Um, I don't have we any more questions to come in for Alan. Okay, there's one more here. We'll go ahead with it. Um, my question is regard to the stud dogs, hips. Um, the score on those in the progeny as a deciding factor in the stud dog selection. There seems to be studs that are improvers, having a moderate score themselves, but they are producing dogs with scores that have higher scores. Does that make sense to you? So, so, so basically, um, he's saying that the stud dog is producing dogs 
that are having higher scores than he had. Yeah. Okay. Again, you know, this is this this really does get to the nub of it um, to a certain extent. Um, and it, it gets back to the predictive value of um, the extended hip score. Um, and if I can make an assumption and assume that that stud dog was hip score that maybe just gone one year of age, um, it's quite possible that um, his the score possibly, and I'm just using him as an example, flattered uh, flattered his 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 real uh, hip dysplasia uh, score. It, 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 if he was scored at maybe two or three or four years of age. Uh, we probably would have um, seen a, a more reflective uh, score of him. And that's no reflection on the dog or the breeder. It's just one of the, 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 the little failings of the, of the screening test that you will occasionally get a dog um, that um, has a good score uh, or appears to be a good score, but might necessarily be uh, a good score and that's why the likes of the um say the guide dogs and and and, and these organizations are beginning to look more closely at the likes of the pen hip scheme which at 16 weeks of age um will you know quite accurately determine um through um the the, the, the what they call the distraction index um uh, the the um chances of that dog number one developing hip dysplasia themselves and then uh, ultimately passing it on to their progeny um so but again it's worth mentioning these are screening tests there's always going to be uh, issues uh, with 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 screening tests the main thing is to try and get as many dogs on them that ultimately will 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 give us a better idea as to what's going on you know um, so i hope okay. that answers that question a query how important should um how much importance should we put on a single score for a dog or should this be reviewed in relation to the, the parents and grandparents as well? Yeah, um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's an overall picture. And I mean, the more data that you can kind of assemble, um, the, better, the, the better the overall picture is. And most certainly, you know, if you're seeing um, that the grandparents were, we'll just say, 12 or 14 and the parents were 10 and 9 and this dog is an 8 well you know that's a very very positive um you know graph um and it would um you know it, it would it would look good for the um for, for the progeny out of that dog assuming that he was bred to a, a bitch that was below the mean um the breed mean average as well uh, so so yeah um, the more data you can you can look at the better the better picture you'll you'll ultimately have. Okay, how can we as breeders do our best to avoid hip and elbow dysplasia? I think you've covered it really. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I suppose um, put a good bit of thought into getting your breeding stock um, uh, uh, hip and elbow scored, um, and um, you know, make informed decisions on the back of those scores. Um, that's basically what I what I say. Um, would you recommend a puppy being pre-screened? Um, um, yeah. Well, I guess would I recommend a puppy being pre-screened? Um, hmm. Well, with the, with the hip extended view, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not certain I would, to be honest. Um, I, I think if the owner had uh, any doubt or, or, or any niggling suspicion, then absolutely. Um, but um, if, if they were ultimately going to get it done when the, the dog was one year old, um, well, then um, I, I, I don't think so. Um, unless they were going to go down the road of the pen hip scheme, which you can do from, from 16 weeks of age. Um, but um, other than that, I'm not certain that, that I would, yeah. Okay. Um, 
if you screen a dog at an older age, would environmental effects come into play with some packing? Yeah, so so this is <clears throat> this is the thing. Um, the environmental, you see, the the HIP score is meant to take that into consideration, right? So seven of the um, seven of the nine columns that they scored the HIPs on are for secondary arthritic change. So that secondary arthritic change is ultimately going to be determined by environmental factors. Um, so um, it so those environmental factors will only influence a dysplastic HIP in in reality. Yeah. Um, so it will just show the level of dysplasia in a in a kind of a more real light. Um, the older you you screen the dog, the, the older you um, hip score the dog. Um, if the dog didn't have hip dysplasia in the first place, it shouldn't really environmental factors really shouldn't affect the conformation of the joints. OK. Um... What do you think of the pop scan program? Oh, I was wondering would that come up. Um, yeah, uh, gosh, it's it's um, <laughs> like you know, I I was I was a little bit um, iffy about it at the beginning, and then I saw that UCD um, got involved, which kind of made me think that there's possibly something to it. Um, and uh, when I went to research it uh, uh, there recently again, um, I see that everything has stopped again. And I, 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 I don't know was it due to COVID or what, but there, there, there doesn't seem to be much coming out from from the research from UCD regarding pub scan at the moment. So, um, look, all I'm going to say is I'm going to keep an open mind on it. Um, I, I don't have any huge evidence to suggest that it's going to be the thing, um, but. Um, uh, we'll wait and see. It's very much early days, is it? We haven't any data out from, from any studies from it yet, so we'll see. Yeah. Looking, and this, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, because it is a, an opinionated question, but um, looking at the, what's called the leniency between BVA and ANKC, from your professional point of view, do you think one is being more lenient than the other? Um, yeah. Um, okay. At, 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 at the beginning, I I thought that the um, that the AN, that the ANKC system was um, a bit more lenient uh, than the BVA system. Um, as the more I've submitted to the ANKC um, scheme, um, the more confident I am in it. Um, and I guess, you know, it comes back to the fact that we can sometimes get a little bit too caught up in the numbers, right? And, you know, um, we could get a score back of, of, of an eight and an owner kind of disappointed that it wasn't a six. Whereas in actual fact, these are these are really just screening tests and we just want to make sure that you know um that, that we're kind of heading towards the breed average maybe slightly better than it and a point or two here or there i don't know does it make a huge difference in the end but to answer the question um i haven't seen that discrepancy that i thought i was going to see uh, as the months have gone by um you know, I guess with the BVA system, you have you have three scrutineers looking at them. They they possibly in the odd circumstance will kind of pick up one or two small things that one scrutineer in Australia doesn't. Um, but that's only speculation. Um, as it stands at the moment, I must say I've been I've been fairly happy with the the Australian scheme, to be honest. Yeah. Um, would you expect an active sport dog to have a worse score if scored at Seven compared to a two. Well, it would depend on if that active sports dog had hip dysplasia um, in any shape or form. Um, if it if it had, um, well, then you know I would expect obviously that um, by the time it got to seven years of age, 
that its score would be worse than it was at two. Um, but if it if it hadn't hip dysplasia, it, it shouldn't be it shouldn't matter. Um, so uh, and again, just to refer back to our, our old friends, the Greyhounds, um, their hips don't change um, from uh, from when they're young to when they're middle aged. Um, so it's only if the hip dysplasia gene is there that we would expect to see changes in the joints as they get older, if that makes sense. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, Jennifer is asking, is there any tests or tell signs that your dog is at risk of FCE? Um, of fragmented coronary process, is it FCP? FCE. FCE. What does she mean by FCE? Maybe she can clarify. We can come back to that question. I wonder yeah. is it F, I'd, I'd say it's FCP for Peter, fragmented oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, um, is there any tell sign? Yes, there is. Um, uh, there's um, basically if you um, grab the dog's or hold the dog, grab the dog's paw and have the elbow in a, in a kind of a flexed position and um, rotate the paw out the way. Um, if there's FCP there, um, the pup will resent it. Um, uh, also, if you press on the inside of the elbow, um, where, the, where this famous FCP is, um, then it will also resent it. Um, so um, there, there are two little tells that you can kind of check on your pup or dog, I should say, uh, to see whether uh, they have or they haven't that condition. And you see, with with these elbow dysplasia conditions, they're they're generally what we call juvenile conditions. So they're generally when they're when they're clinically significant, we'll see them uh, between five and eleven or twelve months of age. Um, so um, so yeah, so that that's basically the story with them. Yeah. Okay. And that's a wrap with all the questions, Alan. Oh, great. Yeah, great. Well, thank listen, thanks, very much. thanks very much um, to everybody for, for really good questions. Um, I hope I answered them to the best of my ability. And um, yeah, it was great. It was great being invited to uh, speak at, at this meeting. Well, thank you. That's our third webinar. Thank you. And to everyone who's asking um, about the start of the webinar, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted through YouTube on the Munster um, Agricultural Facebook page and YouTube channel and the website. So you'll be able to get that up there. So if you've missed out on anything or you felt that you haven't been able to get into the webinar um, for the start, don't worry, it's being recorded and it will be posted. So you won't miss out. Alan, thanks a million for everything. It's been really good. Thanks, Eve. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.